Can a corned beef summit solve the state's problems? And Springfield and Chicago will both be getting new mayors. We'll talk about it next on Capital View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we try to let you know what's going on in Springfield and around the state of Illinois. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. And uh, it's kind of a lull in the middle of the holiday season that's coming upon us, but the legislature is coming back soon. And, uh, and we've got some interesting city politics to talk about too. And luckily I have a couple of experts from both of those fields. Uh, Jim Leach is here, News and Program Director, WMAY in Springfield. Bernie. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. We hear your voice in the morning from time to time. Uh, Melissa Hahn is here, State House Bureau Chief, Illinois Radio Network at the Capitol. Uh, sending out reports to 55 or so stations. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. And uh, Corn Beef Summit. What you know? We've had beer summits in, <laughs> in at the White House and uh, in Chicago after the U.S. Senate race, and now we've had a Corn Beef Summit because Pat Quinn, our governor, got the idea after uh, uh, accepting the concession of uh, Bill Brady to invite him to Manny's Deli in Chicago to talk over state issues with corn beef. How are we doing with that? I hear it's a very good sandwich. <laughs> I've never sampled one myself, but I hear it's very, very good. You know, and it's interesting because we had uh, Mark Kirk and Alexi Genulius do this as well after their campaign where they were calling each other liar and mob banker and now uh, uh, Pat Quinn and Bill Brady getting together. And if you were to believe the campaign rhetoric of both of these guys, one is a bumbling incompetent who coddles criminals and the other is an extremist, misogynistic tax deadbeat. Uh, You're so taking all this much too seriously, Jim. <laughs> anyway. Well, but it is kind of interesting though. And I wonder how seriously people take it when they, when they have this vicious rhetoric against each other in the course of the campaign and then say we can set it all aside, split a sandwich, talk over issues and find some common ground. Um, it, it, it's political theater and I think people recognize that and it, it certainly didn't sound afterwards like anybody's mind was particularly changed just by the act of getting together and breaking bread and corned beef in the middle of it. All right. Well, you know, one key issue in the campaign, of course, was that Quinn was for an uh, income tax increase in the state. and. Brady was against it. That apparently didn't change, but they said they might be able to work together on some other issues. And, well, and, and hopefully, because that one will never get better, the tax <laughs> increase issue. And, you know, I think it's important. Yes, it was political theater, but given that campaigns are nothing but political theater, I think it was about time that more candidates did put their, their issues aside and come out shaking hands. Um, it, you know, this was a very ugly campaign season. It was just brutal and, and it was very long because of that gap between the primary and the general. I hope that more candidates will do this and, and realize that people like to see candidates sticking with the issues and saying things like, we agree to disagree and not just blistering each other over personal issues, family issues, etc. I don't know that it'll make a, a, a significant dent in campaigns. But at least it kind of cleaned up the end of the, well, you know, the election. It's, in, it's interesting because now as we are moving right into a city election, which we'll talk about later, uh, across the state really in, in big cities, including Springfield and Chicago, it seems like there's always another election in Illinois, but others have said, you know, in the good old days, if they still exist before morning radio on every station, no offense, but 24-7 <laughs> news cycles on, on television, there was the time to campaign and then there was the time to be done with that and to govern. And it seems like at times that's almost been lost because the campaign goes on. You still hear, you know, people in Washington who are supposed to go meet the president change the date on the president, which is, you know, a little bit odd. But, you know, maybe it's a time in Illinois. I mean, because there are lots of problems. The legislature uh, has six scheduled days of uh, veto session this fall. They've had three. They've got the Thanksgiving week off. They will be back for three more. Any possibility that something significant will get done on state borrowing on, on some, some bills? I'm going Melissa, to guess no. And, on, and, on anything? And there's, well, two reasons. Okay. Number one, state lawmakers don't really do anything much before a deadline. So 
you know, there's really not much incentive for them to come in and, and get their business taken care of. Why would you? Well, what about like there, there's 10 no or 13 or $15 billion in debt and all of the people in your district who I'd are state contractors calling yeah. you and saying, we need our money and it's months behind. I don't behind. think that'll get solved. If they couldn't do it before the election, why session. would they worry about it after the election? Well, well because a tax increase arguably is easier to pass after an election because that's, you won't, in, well, you know, the you wrath have, of, and you have lame duck members yes. now who are not going to be members Now anymore. you have extra days in January. House Speaker right. Mike Madigan That's called, what, four extra days. Uh, Senate President John Cullerton, another Democrat, called two extra days in January. And this is January. before the new General Assembly is seated. Correct. So it's still the lame ducks will be so, there for the, at the yeah, beginning of so the year. Why, why would they even think about doing it? Now, right. some of the lawmakers that I talked to last week um, during the veto session as they were leaving um, tried to make it sound like well, you know, negotiations don't really start until the lawmakers are here and we really get some dynamics moving. And I thought, well, if that were the case, somebody should have been meeting a couple of weeks ago. But, of course, no one's interested in that. No, they're not going to solve many problems. I'd be surprised if they solve any during the actual veto session. And, and, and I'm not alone in saying that some of these things probably won't get solved next session. I mean, it, it's still a very polarized legislature, and it's a polarized state. And when Melissa talked about how voters really want people to talk about issues, I think they say that, but in reality, they respond well to the negativity and to the attacks. And I think the legislature learns and understands that. And these guys aren't much interested in giving a lot of ground. I don't see a lot of since there's a whole lot of interest in compromise. When Mike Madigan has the votes uh, on his uh, in his caucus to be able to pass a tax increase measure, but insist the Republicans have got to take the heat too, and they're going to have to feel the pain of it if it's going to happen, and otherwise it's not going to happen. The, the, the battle lines have been drawn, and there, I don't get a sense there's a mood for compromise well, even after the election. Okay, but it's. It's always been that way in a sense, and yet there is a time, some would say, if the state really needs money for people to do the right thing. Sometimes with a wedge, sometimes with a governor giving you largesse for your district, sometimes maybe with the redrawing of legislative boundaries after the latest census is released, and because for in two years from now there'll be new boundaries, Maybe that can be used, and then I've heard others say this, maybe that can be used as a carrot to get some people on board. Well, and let me bring in, up another carrot. Um, Senate President John Cullerton called two very interesting special committees. One, the Workers' Compensation Reform Committee. The other, the Medicaid Reform Committee. I don't know that they'll be able to solve much, but let's face it, Republicans have been screaming for that Those for years. Those are big years. issues for Brady Of course. So if, if the Democrats are willing to give a little bit, on not only calling these committees, but actually advancing some issues. And, and, and I want to point out that these committees are made up of three Republicans, three Democrats. So, you know, there's, there's no, there's no uh, way for Democrats to just run at ramshod. There will have to be agreement. And Chris Redonio, the Senate Minority Leader, uh, Republican from Lamont, is on at least one of those committees already. Um, if, if there is some compromise on those issues, my question to her and some of the other Republicans was, does that soften you up a little bit when it comes to voting for any of these Democratic pushes, whether it be income tax, pension reform, anything? She insisted no, but let's face it, the Republicans have always said, we need to cut, we need to reform Medicaid, we need to reform things like workers' comp, we need to be better for business, then we can talk tax increase. And she has been uh, much more open to that than uh, House Republican leader Tom, Tom Cross. Cross. Yeah, at least he sounded like it. So, yeah. yes. So, to me, that does indicate a little movement. I don't <laughs> know that they would go as far as a tax increase, but, you know, maybe the pension reform or the uh, pension borrowing. Borrowing, come because out. If, they, if they don't borrow, like, I guess Pat Quinn wants $4 billion, then, you know, the claim is you don't pay that now, you're going to pay so much more in the future, Correct. like. 20 some because the billion. system is about to sell off assets at this point. And that really to, hurts in the yes, long term. Yes, of course. The wild card, too, is is Pat Quinn savvy enough to, to pull this off, to do the kind of horse trading you're talking about? I mean, the, when you talk about those things that have happened in the past, mm -hmm. you're talking about guys like Jim Thompson and George Ryan. They knew how to play the game. They knew how to cut the deal. Uh, Governor Quinn, at this point, hasn't really shown much of, a, of an instinct for the art of that kind of deal. Uh, he tends but he to is coming on two years in, in office. Well, he, he is, and, <laughs> and now he's got four years without having to be constantly worried about running mm -hmm. for re-election. Maybe he develops some of those skills, or maybe now the fact that he's uh, bringing back his, his former chief of staff, bringing him back in a senior advisory position, maybe he's got some of the insider uh, people who can sort of help him navigate that, because he hasn't done particularly well so far in, in bringing all the, the caucuses together, bringing the leaders together, working out these deals. He tends to paint himself in 
into, into rhetorical corners and then can't get himself out of them. And that, I think, has really kind of hampered yeah. progress on some yeah. of these And issues. I would actually go the other way. I think an indication that he brought Jerry Sturmer back on is an indication that he didn't learn his lesson. <laughs> he, needs, he needs a few people like... Um, Rama, how about Rahm Emanuel? Uh, well, oh, that's way over the top. <laughs> Rahm Emanuel would just come on in and take over. But they need a couple of people like, uh, who was the guy with Blagojevich's, um, who was? Bradley Tusk. Brad Tusk. He needs a few Brad Tusks in there to shake things who's up. deputy governor. Jerry yeah. Sturmer is not a Brad well, Tusk. Well, Jerry Sturmer was, you know, for years with Voices for Illinois Children, an advocate for uh, social services for kids in particular. Michelle Sadler, who was Department of Human Services Secretary, is now Chief of Staff, but Sturmer, because he sent out like three political emails from work, just resigned during the campaign, now he's being brought back. Um, after, which a lot of people thought it was overkill for him to leave the administration for, well, for it, that transgression it in was. this town. Sure. And Melissa's correct. Uh, Sturmer is not a Brad Tusk. He is what, what they used to call a goo goo in, he in these like parts. Seems like a nice guy. Uh, yeah. A, a it, exactly. good government person. But I, I think that Quinn has been maybe even a bit more adrift after Sturmer was out and, and we had sort of the upheaval and things. I just think he needs people that he's a little more comfortable with. But she's right. He, he needs somebody that's got more of the instinct for, for the deal and maybe the instinct for the kill. Uh, to be able to actually uh, enforce some of these things. The governor talks a good game, but then can't actually make anybody do you, what you he's know, saying. You know, I found it very interesting, uh, and it was such a contrast to, like, Rod Blagojevich's first full veto session. I guess this was the second one for Pat Quinn, but I remember back then Rod Blagojevich had a press conference every afternoon, part of which was bashing legislators. Quinn has been generally very open, but in the first three days of the veto session, he was in Springfield, he was meeting behind closed doors on various things with various legislators, but did not have a public event. I thought that, you know, I guess the question is, is he, and I've seen somebody else write this too, is he, is it that he's getting better at strategizing and maybe thinking all of this talk about what we need to do because it's for the good of the state may sound may not get the deal done and maybe he's figuring this out. I don't know, but it was just interesting because he's been, he was always, uh, you know, Pat Quinn basically established the Sunday press conference in his days of right. political activism from the Coalition for Political Honesty and cutting the size of the legislature and creating Citizens Utility Board. He would, he knows that's a slow news day and that the inexperienced reporters in Chicago are on so you get a good story on the news Sunday night or in the paper Monday morning if you do it on Sunday. and. Uh, and for him not to have not to have any public appearances while the legislature's in right after the election in Springfield was just interesting to and me. And that's why I bring up Sturmer in that, again, <clears throat> to me, it sort of completes the transition of, of Pat Quinn, the idealist, to Pat Quinn, the politician, in, in the typical Illinois vein. This is his guy. He wants his guy back. And, and his guy left under a bit of a cloud, a minor cloud, but a bit of a cloud nonetheless. Really now the election's done. In, in comes his guy back into the inner circle. Pat Quinn maybe is learning a little bit more about how the game gets played at this level and is actually starting to, to do some of that. Maybe that's a, a harbinger for, for what might come down the road if he can start actually learning how to close these deals and to lean on lawmakers a little bit. Well, we're going to have four years to watch now that uh, the voters have, by vast uh, plurality of 19,000 votes, given him the opportunity <laughs> to do so. There's a couple of, uh, of issues that are, that are out there. There's this big gambling package that's being talked about, like f four or five new casinos five. in Illinois, including Chicago and Rockford and Danville. Um, and the slots at uh, uh, and at slots horse tracks. Yeah. yeah, slot machines at horse tracks. Plus it, expansion it, at the existing and this would be plus slots at O'Hare and Midway. A lot of a lot of new gambling. Slots is for everyone. Any chance of this happening, or is it already too heavy with I uh, think it's ornaments? already too heavy, yeah. although the Horsemen Association and the track folks are all on board because they have always said that casinos hurt their business. This at least gives them a chance to recoup some of that, that gambling uh, money. I, I, so many of these bills have not passed before, and now this is slightly bigger. I, I don't know if they thought that adding the slots at O'Hare, which by the way would not be for just the regular person. You wouldn't just drive up to O'Hare and gamble. These are for folks who had already gone through clearance, et cetera, who were really waiting for planes. But I don't know if they thought that was somehow going to win more votes or not, but I just don't see it happening. They're talking about a billion dollars in new revenue. Some of that is a little iffy. Um, at least according to, to, if you compare it to what casinos have brought in before, I just don't see them embarking on something as big as that when they can't even decide to shore up the pensions, which is a required payment. I, I just, I don't see it. And five votes, or five boats, 
That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. And, and historically, she's right. When, when you would think that this would be a, a quick and relatively painless source of revenue and lawmakers keep saying no to it, there's no reason to think they would this time until, as you said, at some point they've got to stop and look and say, oh, we've got 13 billion dollars here we've got to yeah. make up somehow. We've got to find it from someplace. That's about the only thing I could see turning the tide on is when they suddenly start to realize the the, the massiveness of the problem they're yeah. up against. And, and Plus the existing casinos are against it. Yeah, and Because they uh, say it will take yeah. folks And there are away still, their, despite the fact that this cat is way out of the bag, but there are still moral arguments against gambling mm -hmm. that you know we continue yes. to hear and the, the devastation of some families for people who don't handle it well when somebody's asking them to take all their money and throw it in a machine on the hope that they can uh, not work again. I think a sign that that won't go very far is, is that uh, the Democrats couldn't even get it out of committee in the Senate. Uh, they had a uh, subject matter hearing only. The room was absolutely packed. They had to stop letting people into the room because it was so packed. Um, so it's, it's already got an awful lot of opposition. Okay, um, Ill and I may be getting close, and you see on the internet certainly there's a lot of back and forth on civil unions being uh, possible, becoming recognized in law in Illinois, uh, same-sex partners. Uh, Melissa, I don't know if I should even ask you because you're saying no to everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that I'm saying no. I'm saying I'm yeah, not I know. the lawmaker. No, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen you know, with that one? I, I wouldn't <laughs> be surprised if it finally has a chance because you know what? It doesn't involve money. Uh -huh. <laughs> so lawmakers may put some more energy into trying to get it to pass because it doesn't involve the budget and. And uh, Greg Harris, right, the, the state, uh, representative state representative from Chicago, from Chicago the chief who sponsor. is the chief sponsor, um, he's been pushing very hard. And, and you have to respect the fact that he comes out and says, I don't have the votes yet, but I'm close. And you actually think that he is being honest. Um, so that's to his credit. But, you know, he wins a few more people, and, and that's... That's good to go. This is one of those issues that has been before the legislature for how many years? A good six that yeah. I know of oh, since well. I've been reporting this time around. But so Even you know, the speaker says now he thinks this has got a real shot at passage, which mm -hmm. certainly would seem to, because Mike Madigan doesn't usually go out on that kind of a limb unless he thinks it actually does. As like Melissa said, it doesn't cost anything. And actually, the governor says it will give an economic boost. You'll see more catering dollars spent and invitations for being printed and flowers, yeah. exactly. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, they should sell that as an economic development. Well, the, yeah. I mean, the governor's talked about that. This actually would help to create jobs. You would actually see mm -hmm. more, even though well, they uh, go to great pains to say yeah, this is we're, not we're, marriage. It's not, yeah, because we're not becoming But Iowa, the opponents uh, yeah, of it say point. it absolutely is marriage, but in fact, it would be treated in the same way. You'd have ceremonies, you'd have food, you'd have flowers, you'd have invitations, you'd have tux rentals even to go and have a civil <laughs> union at a courthouse. You'd have a lot of things like that. Uh, one other thing of interest in particular, perhaps to Springfield, is this fumigation. Uh, mm -hmm. word again, which Speaker Madigan brought up once in a bill that didn't pass about the Blagojevich and perhaps at that point the uh, George Ryan appointees who were going to be let go from state government unless the governor brought them back because too many folks were hanging on who maybe shouldn't. And then uh, President Cullerton of the Senate uh, has introduced something similar to at least say everybody who gets approved by the Senate will have to be renominated if if they, their term is expired, they have to be renominated by the, the governor or else they're out in a certain period of time. Uh, and that's like 500 some people. Any big effect here, or is this another just kind of well, uh, spotlight know, to Quinn? I, I think it is a spotlight to Quinn. So um, the, this was another complaint by the Republicans that, and some Democrats, that Quinn never did get rid of so many of those Blagojevich appointees. So this kind of pushes Quinn's hand to get it done. And you'll notice that, what, 24 hours after that bill was introduced, all of a sudden Quinn asked for, you know, uh, resignation letters from many of his Although he had folks. broadcast that I, that he was going to do that before, yes, I think, yes. shortly after the But election. he didn't do it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and gosh, he's been in there for mm -hmm. a while. So, um, so this was another uh, thing that Democrats can dangle in front of the Republicans and say, look, we're listening. We're, we're, listening. we're trying to compromise here. Um, I don't know how effective it'll be. I don't know that it'll pass, but it certainly shook things up. This is very different from the fumigation bill in that the original fumigation bill affected a lot of folks who were not appointees, but they were right. hired during, during the the last couple of governors, and you were talking about maybe like not frontline state workers, right. but awfully close to that. And these are all folks who are pretty high yeah, up the if, food chain. If you've got to be approved and by these the Senate, are, which these is are, a lot of it's a lot of board and commission members too, yes. who don't even get paid. Or, yes, or don't it's get a paid total much. of about 700 positions. It's just about 150 of them are, are empty right now. 
and these are the folks that they should think about cleaning house with. And these terms are have been expired for years. I mean, in some cases, you have people whose terms expired three, four, five years ago. Oh, one was 11 years ago. Yeah. It was an Edgar appointee. So these are the folks who should be swept, not always swept out, but at least should be told, look, this yeah. appointment was up. And You're one of the top people. You got to apply. And again. sometimes a new and accidental governor has trouble keeping up with things like that. <laughs> uh, but yes. we're not accidental anymore. We've had an election. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, let's let's talk a bit about mayor races because there are some very familiar names in Chicago. I mentioned Rahm Emanuel before, former congressman, actually worked on a congressional race once, like 30 years ago in Springfield. But uh, running for mayor of Chicago, uh, there's. Danny Davis, Congressman Carol Mosley Braun, who served down here and was a U.S. Senator. There's James Meeks, who was a current uh, state senator, all in the running. Gary Chico, who's run for statewide office before and ran Chicago schools, is in the running. Miguel Del Valle, who was a state senator and now is, is it uh, city, clerk? Is city clerk of Chicago, is in. And Roland Burris filed, <laughs> or people who want Roland Burris to be mayor filed uh, petitions for him. It's interesting theater. Does it matter much to uh, us in Springfield? It's like American and, Idol, and though. Central Illinois. You, you've got you've got a, a few, you know, real shining stars, and then a few who don't seem to realize just how bad they are throwing themselves into the race too. I mean, it should matter because obviously the mayor of Chicago has a great deal of influence down there. Many in the would say that's the strongest political position in the state. Yeah. Well, and especially if you get someone like Rahm Emanuel. Oh my, I'm sure he would make a huge impact mm -hmm. in the state legislature just because he is a steamroller. Um, you yeah. know, you, you, Rahm Emanuel wants you to do what Rahm Emanuel wants or he will run you over. So <laughs> I, I think it wouldn't be Have like the Rahm? days, no. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be like the days with Mayor Daley who had his people to do his bidding in Springfield. I think, I think Rahm would be a much greater force in the Capitol mm -hmm. than and maybe it wouldn't be in front of our well, eyes. Well, interesting, because I think, I think Daly's been a force, too, because people know, you know, what they're supposed to do. Not as much as when Daly's father was mayor. Yes. But there's still But you rarely saw control. the second Daly down in Springfield, except um, uh, we saw him when they did the Taste of Chicago in Springfield. But I think Rahm is just so much more mm, forceful. forceful. Okay, yeah. interesting. And, yes. and I... Uh, I didn't know if he was a man of the neighborhoods, even though he's been a congressman up there. But uh, Mark Brown is a columnist with the Chicago Sun Times, and when he recently spoke on a panel in Springfield, he said that you know behind the scenes up there, a lot of daily people are behind Rom, which just makes it interesting and mm -hmm. adds to the idea that uh, he's going to be a formidable candidate. And I think this mayoral race will determine what the Chicago machine will be for the next decade. Is or there a so. Chicago machine? Anyway. Yeah, just a small one. <laughs> um, Let's turn uh, to Springfield. Uh, for eight years, almost, we've had Mayor Tim Davlin, and uh, there was some great mystery in recent weeks. He's had some problems, including uh, it was discovered by the State Journal Register. <laughs> Bruce Rushton, our reporter, uh, found some stuff, uh, including a tax lien uh, of $90,000 on his home, covering like three years, and there's an estate that he's in charge of that's uh, supposed to provide some money to Catholic charities, but uh, as we tape this show, there's been no accounting of where that's at, uh, although a, a judge has asked. So uh, the mayor says that had nothing to do with him not seeking another term, that he is just didn't want to get burned out. It's a very demanding job. Uh, and there are now eight people filed. Your thoughts, Jim Lee? Well, interesting because the, the, the mayor does in fact say that uh, you know two terms is probably enough. You have to give so much to the job. And yet he's been acting a lot like a candidate for, for a number of months now, raising money over the summer. Had a He raised $50,000 at Todd Renfro's house one day. <laughs> had yeah. a political uh, a committee put up a new Facebook page, you know, acting like somebody's going to run. Wouldn't talk about whether or not he was running or not. Definitely wanted to keep people guessing until the very last minute. And then with no fanfare, no announcement, no nothing, just simply didn't, didn't file, file petitions by, right, at, at by the, the deadline. deadline. Some people obviously knew because there were some folks who nobody really expected to be in the race, including some Davlin loyalists mm -hmm. who jumped in at the last minute. So they apparently had seen the tea leaves and, and were reading the signals. But now you do have a, a crowded eight-person primary. And just like in Chicago with 17 candidates, uh, you'll have a primary. You'll have some surprises there because you'll see some split constituencies, you'll see some people who will be dividing uh, votes and uh, somebody could squeak through into the general election with a very small percentage and then things get really interesting. Uh, Mike Farmer is the head of economic development for the city and he's one of the people that uh, filed petitions. Quite, it was an odd kind of a thing because he, he uh, filed, he, he walked over with petitions at 10 minutes until at the before the closing time, 5 p.m. Monday. 
uh, basically said, my name is Mike Farmer. I hope the city, you know, does good things in the future. Happy Thanksgiving. And he turned around and walked away. Yes. And this was the only time during the day, the last half hour, where there were actually a number of media types there. So he basically turned his back on the possibility of, of talk. And so people think, even though he's voted Republican a lot, Davlin is a Democrat in name, although he says he votes 50-50. Uh, you know, people think maybe Farmer will be the guy, and Davlin has said nice things about him. Sheila Stocks Smith used to be the leg er, education liaison for Mayor Davlin. She was kind of a surprise circulator of petitions over the last weekend, filed, said she didn't talk to the mayor, but said that uh, when she saw that Farmer was getting in it, she figured that the mayor wasn't running, so she felt free to go and do this. Uh, I'll just go quickly. Mike Houston, former mayor, is in it, mm -hmm. who's a Republican, but doesn't necessarily always hew the line. But, you know, I mean, everybody will say they're independent and represent all people. Mario Ngoglia, who is a tailor in town and has run before as a write-in. William McCarty, former village president of uh, Williamsville, Williamsville right. Bill McCarty. Frank Coons, alderman, who can't run for another term and has long said he's running for mayor. Mike Coffey, Jr., who runs Saputo's restaurant with his family and is chairman of the Convention Center Board. Paul Palazzolo, the Sangamon County Auditor. Now, Palazzolo, Coffey, and Houston have asked the Republican Party in Sangamon County for support. Tony Libri, the chairman of the party, says they've all agreed to drop out if they don't get the nod from the party so that we can focus on a candidate, but only Palazzolo says he agreed to that. So, Jim. <laughs> well, they, and they all still sound like they're running, and at this point, again, in an eight-person primary, <clears throat> why not just roll the dice and, and take your odds uh, with it? Uh, nobody will really focus on this till after Christmas, so you'll have about four weeks there. You'll spend whatever money you need to, to make a splash there. They've all got fairly good name recognition, and don't discount the Saputo's connection. It's a very popular eatery <laughs> where a lot of important it's people the red hang sauce. out. And that, that may be the deciding factor there, is yeah, how, how much you enjoyed your lasagna may determine where you vote for in the race for mayor. All right, well, well, because that's how voters are. They will, they will vote for somebody whose name is connected to something they know and trust, mm -hmm. and if it's the lasagna, well, <laughs> Mr. Coffey appreciates that. As we, uh, as we end this round, it'll be an interesting spring, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, Jim Leach, Melissa Hahn, thanks for joining me. I'm Bernie Schoenberg, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time on Capital View.